European cities with their trams and their cobbles. Honestly, if this 9-11 doesn't end up with every single rattle in the book by the end of this trip, it is done remarkably well. It has been <laughs> shaken every which way you can imagine. And tarmac. Hello one and all, welcome to Seeing Through Glass. There are more cobbles, there are more cobbles. Hello one and all, welcome to Seeing Through Glass. Welcome to very bumpy, very cobbly, but very beautiful Riga in Latvia. Uh, today, I'm gonna go and check out arguably one of the cheapest supercars one can get their hands on, a Ferrari 456M GT. This was kind of the Ferrari FF or the GTC4 Lusso of its day. In 1994, when it came out, it was a four-seater V12 that cost nearly 200,000 pounds, which in today's money is about 350 grand. However, just 20, five years later you can find these cars on the used market in the UK for like 30 or 40 grand which makes it less than a new Audi RS3 a V12 Ferrari for less than an Audi so I'm off to meet up with a local car owner to just try and understand why this car is so relatively affordable I, I realize 30 or 40 grand is still a lot of money but for a V12 Ferrari it's really not that much it could be, it could be awful. Maybe that's why, but we're going to find out. So yes, off we go. Welcome to Riga. Wow, thank you very much. <laughs> nice to meet you finally. Andres, yes. How are you doing? Yes. Hi, I'm Sam. Martin. Hi, nice to meet you. Hi, Bro. nice to meet you. We thought it would be oh, a... This is a nice surprise. He has to greet with a grandfather greet. Yeah, this That's is a, a very nice... Oh, you know, I'm actually, my heart lies with Ferrari. <laughs> but, but this year... But, drive, but you're driving for... I'm Porsche. driving for a Porsche, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and this year, I just, I get... Uh, my parking is awful, by the way, in terms of my lineup. But uh, I keep getting uh, distracted by these. That is beautiful. <laughs> So there we go, you can see the cars down there. We've come up because this is actually the Riga Motor Museum, which some of you may recognize this front end is slightly styled on the front of a Rolls Royce. Yes, that is, that is what's happening right now. Anyway, I'm gonna pop inside and see what's here before heading out in the fry. Oh, the cars look good up here. Oh yes. So the cool thing the guys just told me about this museum is that after the war, the Soviet Union went around and sort of bought loads of European and American cars, took them back to the Soviet Union as sort of research projects, as things that they could look at and learn from. Once they'd done that, they were just sending them off to the scrapyard, uh, and a load of Latvian car collectors went around and bought up the cars that were going to the scrapyard. They recognised that they were something amazing, bought them up, and uh, yeah, and now they display them in here. So some really rare and wacky cars that would have been sent to a Soviet Union scrapyard, but are now on display in Latvia. So they found this in the Soviet Moscow, Union? So in, in Moscow? In Moscow, oh, wow. yeah, and it was, uh, that was already the season to go on the press. Okay, so it's going to be crushed. And it's all been saved, yes. Just to recycle for metal. But they, but they recognized it. The guy, he, he got it through the archives, this information that the car is there, and he went there. Ah, oh, okay, with, so with, he knew with, it was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah with it. chocolate boxes and <laughs> champagne and so, and he persuaded, okay, we will, oh. we will, we will take it. Uh, yeah, we have those. In on Soviet the, times, there was uh, those Saturdays when you clean up your house, like, uh, but it was uh, like a <laughs> no, countrywide yeah, thing. Okay, countrywide thing. Plan to clean out storage. Sure, let's just crush a load of yeah, stuff. We don't need it. Yeah. Oh, I love this. I don't know if you can see the plaque down here. We're looking at a V16 engine with 520 horsepower. The car weighs 824 kilos. Absolutely insane, considering this is 1938. Oh, it's good to be in a Ferrari. <laughs> I've talked about it a few times this year. As much as the whole Porsche obsession has taken over me, stepping in one of these is always, always the sweet spot, okay. Oh, let's hear this V12 then. Now, 
Now, one thing which I didn't mention in my intro, which Andres did actually point out, this is a manual as well. I mean, in terms of what should be a really sought after car, V12 Ferrari with a manual gearbox, this should be 300,000 pounds still. <laughs> um, anyway, we're gonna go for a little bit of a drive. As you just saw, we went for a lovely tour around the museum, um, but we're gonna go to hopefully some slightly quieter roads. It's Sunday morning, which should mean that there's less traffic, but we think that traffic might start to build up as people make their drives for the Sunday, Sunday lunch drives. Uh, so we're gonna see what we're gonna do, and I'm gonna try and familiarize myself a little bit with this car before, unbelievably, taking on just a seat and having to go in one of these for the first time myself. I like that you got a fire extinguisher back there. That's a man who knows his Ferraris. Yes, uh, <laughs> Italian cars uh, sometimes can be a bit dangerous. <laughs> Gotta be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> say the seating position and the interior space is super nice from the passenger seat but also from the driver's seat you need to sit actually quite close because your uh, your foot need to have enough strength to push the clutch actually it's a which heavy is quite clutch. heavy yeah that's much heavier than the 360s but it's not for me it's not annoying i don't know why let's start up um, it's got a rumble it's got a rumble um, okay, so you were just explaining we have got the old clock push down handbrake, uh, which does sometimes take a while to get used to. Uh, um, uh, and it's not dog leg, we're, we're completely standard six speed manual box. And let's see if I uh, stall it on the first attempt or not. No, he's rolling. Oh, there we go. It's not always a guarantee with me and manuals. Um, so, what I'll say to you guys is that for the very short drive here, this car is unbelievably smooth and comfortable. Uh, it was set up as the everyday usable Ferrari, as the sort of, I guess, GTC4 Lusso or FF has also been positioned in recent years. This was kind of an early version of those cars. Now, I think in the intro, I mentioned this was a 456M, but it's not. This is the standard early version. But you were just saying off camera that they didn't really change much for the M anyway. Exactly, some small adjustments, uh, small improvements, but uh, for me it actually doesn't uh, make any improvement. Any difference? Maybe what is even worse that uh, with this uh, updated version there are mo more places where you can get those sticky parts. Okay, is, you know, uh, <laughs> Enzo's Revenge they call it. Yeah. Which if you don't know is something about older Ferraris that they have this horrible black tack on a lot of the switches which in the heat starts to really come off and go all just everywhere it goes absolutely everywhere and there's very limited amounts of that in this exactly. car apart from apparently in the end they have more of it another thing you might notice is it's quite quiet in here for a five and a half liter v12 even once we start pushing on three and a half thousand rpm it doesn't exactly sing but for you it's kind of perfect right because you use this Try to use this as much as possible. Kids in the car, early starts. You don't want a lot of noise. Exactly, it, it works for me. But uh, I would, I guess, I'm okay to take one next one step uh, towards uh, more screaming. Maybe. Okay, to make it a little bit a louder. Little bit more, yeah. Because you do kind of want that from a V12 Ferrari. You do kind of want a little bit more of the of the sing, I guess. But despite the slight lack of noise, this car definitely gets up and goes. 60 back in the day was sort of five and a half seconds? 5.2, yeah. 5.2, okay, but here we go now, starting to bash through some gears. And yeah, it, it doesn't feel slow. It doesn't feel like you need a ton more horsepower. And it's just got that real classic analog look and feel. And I'm really starting to question why these cars aren't more sought after. Now, Andres, you got this in an auction, right? Yes, uh, I got it in auction. It was not uh, driven for seven years. And uh, it was actually a very risky move. Maybe the most riskiest I took financially in my life. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it worked out quite well because uh, mechanically, actually, those cars are pretty sound when it comes to gearbox, engine. There are no any typical issues or anything like that. Okay. What but are the things that can go wrong with the 456? Yes, this uh, rear suspension, which is uh, self-leveling those shocks uh, at some point will start to leak okay. but it's not so difficult to sort it out because you basically can send them back to Bilstein factory 
they will recondition to them and send you back as new. Windows, those frameless windows are a bit tricky. I guess at that time Ferrari didn't know yet how to make them properly operate and which means that time to time you need to adjust them. And it's good to have some mechanic with you who knows how to do it quickly and... Uh, and then you're fine. And, yeah, exactly. But as a car to live with, day in, day out, it's super easy and comfy, like... You're still getting this sense of Ferrari because of the, well, the steering wheel, the <laughs> port right in the middle. I well, hope it's not the only thing, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, but there's, there's something about it which has still got an essence of Ferrari, but it's a very relaxing and nice place to be. As I told earlier, there is no any issue of taking my one kid to school, another one to kindergarten. For seats, uh, it's actually a deal breaker for me. Wow! I'm really getting carried away here. <laughs> because I think I mentioned to you before, I know of a couple of cars in the UK going for like 30, 40,000 pounds. Yeah. Which for a V12 Ferrari is mad. And now that I'm in this, and you have kept this car looking immaculate from the outside and in, it's a really attractive proposition. Because it's not a huge investment. Okay, fine, it's still a lot of money. But when you're looking at other Ferraris now, even 348s are starting to trickle up towards 50, 60,000 pounds in the UK. So this is probably one of the most affordable Ferraris you can find. Is that the same here? Were you looking at any others before you made the move? I think uh, in Europe, actually, those prices start a bit higher. Okay. But, uh, so it, I think price-wise, it's comparable to 348, actually, the okay. starting point. Uh, but then I, need, I think you need to have some buffer when you buy to sort out those things that I mentioned and maybe some more. Of course, yeah, yeah, you never but, know with uh, Ferrari, there's always little things. There is no such thing as cheap Ferrari, yeah. Yeah, definitely not. But the good part is actually you don't need any, well, you don't need to take it to dealer. Many things are uh, done in very sensible, logical way, so any good mechanic actually can take care about it. Okay, okay, that's fine. Like uh, changing uh, timing belt, uh, you don't need to take out the engine like you need to do on some V8. Yeah, wow, the 355, that's where I love Fix the Fix it like is. for any regular car. I came from 911, 996, okay. and uh, it, uh, well, at the <laughs> beginning on. I was not sure, was it a smart move actually, yeah. because I really enjoyed also that car too. But uh, I guess there is more drama about uh, Ferrari, as always, because in some ways it can scare you more than Porsche. Absolutely. <laughs> Not always uh, good, but sometimes good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think in 911 maybe you have more confidence to exploit those last 10% of uh, performance. Okay. Uh, sure. Uh, with Ferrari, I tend to keep it more on the safe side. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Both I'm, I'm more uh, paying more attention to maintenance to everything, not to mess up anything. And uh, sure. yeah. Yeah, you have to treat it a little bit more carefully, think exactly. about everything you're doing, wait for it to warm up properly, all of these different steps where Porsche you can be a little bit more brutal with it. Yeah, every now exactly. And again. I've said it a few times this year, the last thing I need in my life right now is another car. But give me a morning or a few hours with an old Ferrari and the brain and the heart gets going and Vicky's not with me this morning so I can get carried away and have these kind of thoughts without her telling me off. This thing, just so underrated and forgotten. I, I don't know how everyone else feels about the 456 and obviously this was a short test drive. I have to give a huge thanks to Andres for letting me have a go in this car. Um, we just went for a little poodle around, well, some roads on the outside of town but it just has a a sense to it, a feeling which is just very Ferrari but very usable and there are very few analogue Ferraris, V12s with a manual gearbox which you could use every day but maybe this is one of those cars. I'm getting really really carried away but yeah it looks beautiful, he's done a fantastic job getting it into this shape considering what it looked like when he bought it. But it's been an amazing morning. Anyway, time for me to jump into my car. I've got to head to Tallinn, Estonia today. It's another four hour drive. The, the miles just keep adding up on the 11 but I'll be sad to see this go. I think it is absolutely ace. <laughs> 